بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته كل عام وحضراتكم جميعا بخير بمناسبه حلول عيد الفطر المبارك رغم طبعا تاثرنا بانتهاء شهر رمضان الفضيل بس ربنا سبحانه وتعالى يعيد علينا الايام دي مرارا وتكرارا انا محمود ريحان برودكت مانجر فاركو فارماسيوتيكالز في البدايه بحب اتوجه بالشكر لحضراتكم جميعا لقبول دعوتنا لحضور ويبينار اليوم ويبينار اليوم هو احدى فعاليات الكونتينيوس ميديكال ايديوكيشنال بروجرام لشركه فاركو وطبعا يعني يهمنا النهارده ان هي تكون في يوم مميز مع سبيشاليتي الجراحه وطبعا اللي بيميزها اكتر يعني ويزيدها اسراء وجود قامه من معانا النهارده قامه من قامات الجراحه مش بس في مصر ولا في الشرق الاوسط على مستوى العالم استاذنا الدكتور بروفيسور خالد مجدولي استاذ طب وجراحه القانون والشرك بكليه الطب جامعه اسكندريه ان شاء الله هيكون موجود معانا ولكن في البدايه خلوني اقدم دكتور عطيه سدان سيلز دايركتور شركه فاركو فليتفضل السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته شكرا يا محمود على على المقدمه والتقديم آه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته انا عطيه زيدان سيلز دايركتور شركه فاركو للادويه آه في الاول اسمحوا لي بالاصاله عن نفسي والنيابه عن شركه فاركو وعن حضراتكم وارحب بالاستاذ الدكتور خالد مدبولي بروفيسور بروفيسور اوف كولوريكتال سيرجري فاكولتي اوف ميديسن الكسندريا يونيفرستي وارحب بحضراتكم لتشريفنا في الحضور في الفيرشوال ويبينار هاندز سيرجري ماجيك هاندز اون ميتنج وفي البدايه اسمحوا لي احيي حضراتكم بمناسبه حلول عيد الفطر المبارك عاده الله علينا وعلى اسرنا وعلى بلدنا الحبيبه مصر بالتقدم والرخاء والامان في ظل هذه الجائحه اللي يعني متاثر علينا وعلى العالم جميعا واسمحوا لي اتقدم بالشكر وباقضى واقصى معاني التقدير والاحترام لحضراتكم والاطقم الطبيه المصريه المخلصه على العمل الدؤوب والمتفاني في مواجهه البانديميك كوفيد 19 بانديميك الى ان نصل باذن الله الى بر الامان للانسانيه جميعا. في الحقيقه هذا التجمع العلمي رفيع المستوى ما هو الا مثال على التعاون المثمر والمستمر ما بين شركه فاركو للادويه والميديكال كوميونتي في مصر. فاركو فارماسيوتيكالز از ذا ماذر كومباني اوف فاركو جروب فاوندد باي دكتور حسن عباس حلمي ان 1983. ايت هيلث كير كومبانيز ار اوبريتنج ان ذا فارماسيوتيكال فيلد فور ديفلوبمنت مانيفاكشرنج ماركتنج ديستريبيوتنج اند اكسبورتنج. For of a comprehensive array of generics and branded generic drugs under the name of Farco, along with a rising number of licensed pharmaceutical products. Farco is the large, largest manufacturer of pharmaceuticals in the MENA region, focused on research, formulation, manufacturing, and commercialization of pharmaceutical products. Today, Farco employ, employs over 8,000 employees and has over 750 million packs produced in 2019, ranked as a leader in the Egyptian pharmaceutical market. Farco also exports to 50 plus countries around the world. Farco works toward one goal, which is to provide highly effective and safe pharmaceutical products to patients at an affordable price. Finally, as the largest manufacturer in Egypt, we have a duty toward providing safe and effective pharmaceutical products that are within every patient reach. بشكركم جدا على الاستماع ليا و... واتمنى لحضراتكم محاضره ممتعه و... واستفاده علميه ثمينه بحجم الفاليو بتاع الدكتور خالد وحضراتكم شكرا
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الزملاء بحب الاول اهني حضراتكم بنهايه شهر رمضان وعيد الفطر المبارك كل سنه وحضراتكم طيبين ويعد عليكم الايام بخير وطبعا انا عارف ان كلنا يعني ما قدرناش نعيش رمضان بالطريقه اللي احنا متعودين عليها انما الحمد لله الحمد لله ان احنا كلنا بصحه وبخير وربنا يعدي الايام دي على خير. Today we are going to talk about managing managing penal fistula and how to create a great for patients. Actually, when you are sitting in your clinic, many patients with penal fistula comes to you, and these patients usually having a bad experience about penal fistula. Many of them are talking about this fistula is going to recur anyway. Others are talking to you about the back, if you're going to put a back or not, if you're going to use the laser or you're going to do the conventional surgery. This is usually the discussion that you're going to face with a patient every day. And I did a fellowship in Cleveland Clinic, and I received this warning from Dr. Fazio, the godfather of colorectal surgery in the world. He told me that the good news about anal fistula treatment is that, the, is that patients don't die. But the bad news is that the patients are able to walk around the city telling everyone that you made them incontinent or they got recurrence. And probably this is what's going, what's happening everywhere in the world. Patients go around telling, I have a problem from this doctor did this in the fistula for me. So if we want to make our patient grateful, first we have to look on the surgical anatomy in a because the surgical anatomy of the canal will affect our understanding of the fistula and our understanding how we are going to manage a case of fistula in anal or in the fistula. The inner canal is defined by medical Morgan as the distance between the inner verge and the inner rectal muscle ring. And this inner canal is divided into two parts. The part below the dentate line, which is the anatomical inner canal, and the part above uh, and the, the whole part above and below, which we call it the surgical inner canal. The surgical inner canal is formed by three sphincters. Actually, the internal inner sphincter and the external inner sphincter and the pupillary cells. These are the sphincters that are forming the high pressure zone that constitute the inner canal. On average, the inner canal is longer in males compared to females. And actually, it depends how you are going to measure the length of the inner canal, if you're going to measure it by the MRI or the rigid proctoscopy or by clinical examination or by whatever way. But on average, if you're going to measure it intraoperative, the, it is longer in males, about 4.4 centimeters, versus females, it's around only 4 centimeters length. But actually, you know, these, are, these numbers are all average, and you might have a female with a longer inner canal and the male with a shorter inner canal. Actually, the inner canal muscle looks an ageless muscle. So the length of the inner canal muscle does not differ with age. Young age, old age, probably the same length. And definitely the length will change if events happen during the whole age. For example, delivery, if you have surgery of the inner canal. But age alone does not affect the length of the inner canal. Let me talk a second about the dentate line. It's an important issue. The dentate line is represent a true division between the embryonic ectoderm and the endoderm. The ectoderm below the, in, below the dentate line and the endoderm above the dentate line. And it differs also in innervation. The endoderm, which is above the dentate line, is supplied by sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. And sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves are not sensory nerves. So probably there is no much pain above the dentate line. However, below the dentate line, the innervation is somatic. And this somatic innervation, the patient can feel pain easily. And you cannot talk about inner fistula without talking about the inner cribs. And the inner cribs located at the bottoms of the columns of Morgagni. These are the columns of Morgagni. Columns of Morgagni just above the dentate line, ends at the dentate line. So the inner cribs is the bottom of the inner cribs open in the columns of Morgagni at the dentate line. And these inner cribs found the anal glands. And the inner glands, they are usually six. But we are having a range between three to 12 inner glands 
concentrated on the posterior part of the inner canal. That's why we usually find the fistula posterior. However, we can still find the anterior because the glands are found both posterior and anterior. Actually, more than one anal gland can open in the same crypt, and some crypts have no anal glands at all. And uh, if you if you look to the ducts of the inner gland, the ducts of the inner gland, sorry, this goes from the inner crypts downward and lateral. Some of them end in the interesting trick plane, around half of them, and the other half ends either in the submucosa or in the internal inner sphincter itself. So that's why sometimes we have sometimes we have a submucosal abscess because this gland is present in the submucosa. Sometimes we have intersphincteric abscess because the, this gland is present in the intersphincteric plane. And sometimes uh, we have a different types we are going to talk about in a few moments. So the pathogenesis of the inner fistula it starts with an abscess. And this abscess starts with obstruction of the duct of the inner gland. So obstruction of the duct of the inner gland, the to back pressure with abscess formation in the inner gland itself. And this abscess formation is going to find its way either through the intersphincteric plane downward like here to the anal skin to form intersphincteric fistula or to go outside to perforate the external sphincter and to go down to open the skin here, what we call the transsphincteric fistula. So, obstruction of the duct, the two abscess formation, it can find its way either to the skin to form intersphincteric fistula or to cross the external sphincter to form extra uh, uh, transsphincteric fistula. And these are the, the commonest two types of fistula that are present in uh, the human body. Uh, let me talk. Second, a second part about the internal anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is present. As you can see, this is the ultrasound picture of the inner canal, indoor anal ultrasound. And you can find this white part is the interface between the probe and the inner canal. And this black part is the internal anal sphincter. And then this white part is the external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is a smooth muscle. And this is smooth muscle of the inner sphincter. It forms around 60% of the resting inner pressure. So at rest, when you are sitting like now, when you are not aware with what's going on in the inner canal, the internal inner pressure is keeping 60% of your countenance. The other 40% is made 20% by the external inner sphincter and probably 15% by the inner cushions, which are the rides and 5% by a muscle called the congenital longitudinal muscle that we are going to talk about in a few seconds. The internal inner sphincter below the dentate line is thicker in female. So, strange enough, in female, it is thicker below the dentate line. The second muscle that we are going to talk about, which is called the conjoint longitudinal muscle, this muscle. This is the internal sphincter, and this is the external sphincter, and in between them, this is the conjoint longitudinal muscle. This conjoint longitudinal muscle is a continuation of the longitudinal muscle layer of the rectum. And its fibers, actually, as you can see, it perforate the external inner sphincter to go anchor to the skin, to, co to cause what we call the corrugator cuti cutis in eye, and this corrugator cutis is responsible for the corrugation that is found on the inner canal when you when you look at, at the inner canal even at rest. So this corrugator cutis in eye is made by the conjoint longitudinal muscle that penetrates the external inner sphincter to form the corrugator cutis in eye. Another point just just to pass through is that this conjoint longitudinal muscle as it perforates the external sphincter to form the corrugator cutis in eye, it sends some fibers to go to the submucosa, and these submucosal fibers, what, what we call the trides muscle or the trides ligament, these are, this muscle is responsible for holding the anal cushions or hemorrhoids in place. If cutting or laxity of these muscles, so this lead to prolapse of the hemorrhoids. So the conjoint muscle is responsible for 
corrugator cutis in eye, and at the same time, it forms the trites muscle or the trites ligament that hold the anal uh, cushions or the hemorrhoids inside the anal canal. The third part of the, of the muscle is the, uh, is the external inner sphincter. And this is the external inner sphincter is a striated muscle. This is the muscle that the patient can control. This is not a smooth muscle like the other ones. This is a striated muscle, and striated muscles the patient can control, and it is responsible for 15% of continence during rest, and probably 60% of continence when you use it. In female, just below the buboric talus, there is a natural sphincter defect, anterior here. Natural sphincter defect of the external sphincter, even in nullibarous female. So please, if you look to an MRI of a patient who had previous surgery of inner fistula and you found a sphincter defect anterior below the pupillectalis, so this might probably be a natural defect, not due to the previous surgery. And this natural defect is making it difficult to do fistulotomy in anterior fistula in females because you're already having natural defect and you're gonna cut the sphincter in another part, so you will have two cuts anterior in the sphincter and this might affect the countenance of your patient. Again, you have to talk about the inner space. You have three main inner spaces around the inner canal and they are mirror image, right and left. The first is the interesphincteric space and this interesphincteric place is between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter and where 50% of the inner gland is present. Second space called the isquioanal space. Isquioanal space is a place just outside the inner sphincter. This is the isquioanal space and the third space is the supralevator space. It is present between the uh, muscle and the levator in eye muscle that we call a supralevator um, space. And actually, these three spaces are connected posteriorly. So the intersphincteric place is connected to the other side through posterior track, and again, the supralevator space and the isquioanal space. And that's how horseshoe fistula can occur. If you have infection on one side, the infection can go posterior behind the rectum to go to the other side to form the horseshoe fistula. The isquioanal space is connected to the other side posteriorly through what we call the deep post-anal space. And the deep post-anal space, it's bounded by the levator eye from one side and the anal ligament from the other side. So this image is really important. Connection between two spaces on both sides because this is the only way to explain how horseshoe fistula can occur and why it is mirror image and why it open in one opening, in one internal opening, because usually obstruction of the ducts occur here, abscess starts to be in the intersphincteric plane, it rotates around the rectum to make another opening in the skin, but no new internal opening. So one internal opening, two tracks. Let me again talk about the supralevator Abscess. This is the place where the supralevator space and can form an abscess like this. And this abscess can be either extension of the intersphincteric abscess, and the, in this situation, obstruction of the duct here lead to intersphincteric abscess, and the intersphincteric abscess creep down to form a fistula. So this is, this is an intersphincteric fistula, and then it creeps up and communicate with the supralevator space to cause a supralevator abscess. And in this situation, if you are gonna do probing of the fistula from here, you're gonna go like this, go like this, and then you're gonna find yourself going up parallel to the rectum. And this parallel move to the rectum and you're gonna find no internal opening. Please, in this situation, try not to push the probe because if you push the probe, you're gonna open the rectum here and you will iatrogenically form a high fistula, and it will be very difficult to treat later on. Be sure that if you inject any dye or if you inject the, uh, uh, hydrogen, marks, uh, hydrogen monoxide, it, it will go, uh, hydrogen peroxide, it will go through this way to the internal opening. So it's important to define the internal opening before you do surgery. And if you put a probe and you found the probe is going up 
parallel to the rectum, just to rethink that this might be a blind extension. And this blind extension, you should not get an internal opening up in the rectum. Look for the internal opening downward and then just to do curettage of this supralevator abscess in order to help it to heal. Again, a supralevator abscess can be formed like the other picture, like this one, without having intersphincteric extension to the skin, just supralevator abscess that goes down to open in the upper part of the inner canal. And if this is the situation, the only way to solve the problem of the supralevator abscess is to do internal sphincterotomy, to cut this sphincter, to go transanal like here, to cut this sphincter, so th and then to put your finger to open this abscess cavity, and the abscess cavity can be drained like here, and through the opening of the internal sphincter, and then transanal to go transanal drainage of the supralevator sphincter. After we understand the um, anal spaces around the inner canal, let's look about the Parks classification of anal fistula. The commonest, which is having the letter A, which is this part, obstruction of the duct here, the two abscesses in the intersphincteric place, as we talked before, this abscess find its way to the skin in the intersphincteric uh, space. So this, what we call the intersphincteric fistula, or it can perforate the external sphincter and then open to the skin, what we call the transsphincteric fistula. Or it can go up like this and rotate above the pupillus muscle, what we call a suprasphincteric fistula. And these three fistulas, the uh, intersphincteric, transsphincteric, and suprasphincteric can start from the inner gland itself. Let's look to the first part, which has the letter D, what we call the extra sphincteric fistula. This extra sphincteric fistula, as we can see, it does not pass through the intersphincteric plane. So this means that it is not of cryptoglandular origin. It either iatrogenic, you, you put the probe and then you, you make a false passage through the muscle and to the rectum to form an extra sphincteric fistula, or you can just uh, uh, have a malignancy or IBD that is lead to penetration of the rectum and then it goes down to open to the skin, what we call again, the extra sphincteric fistula. So if you're having extra sphincteric fistula for a patient who have done surgery before for inner fistula, this might be iatrogenic. If the patient has not done surgery before, so this might be due to specific pathology like the IBD or malignancy, Probably it's not due to cryptoglandular origin. Let me talk about the investigations that we are using for anal fistula management. I'm putting this investigation in order to say never do it. Fistulogram has no rule in diagnosis of fistula in anal in 2020 and probably in, in, in 2000. So fistulogram have no rule simply because if you inject the dye from the external opening, first it can creep through the internal opening to the rectum and then goes up. Other, you can have a blind extension that we have seen since few slides. You can have an upward extension like this. So fistulogram is deceiving. And for a fistulogram, you are see, you're gonna see all the fistulae are high. All the fistulae are opening as the rectum. So it is deceiving. It's not gonna direct you correctly in order to manage the fistula. And it will be scary for you, both you and your patients. So what are the elements that can The ultrasound are 2D or three-dimensional indirect ultrasound, into anal ultrasound. This has got an accuracy of about 98%. Actually, we are lacking a lot of indirect ultrasound here in, in, in Alexandria. In Cairo, they got some, and in Mansoura, they got some, but in the, in the ultrasound, we don't have much here. The sensitivity of the three dimension, about 98%. For the 2D, about 88%. So again, you know, it's fair, but it is operator dependent. So you have to do it yourself, or you have to trust the radiologist that is doing the in the ultrasound. 
And when you are going to do in any other town, it has to be 360 Pro, like this one. So you must have a picture like this one. This picture is from a prostatic probe. And some radiologists are doing ultrasound by a fistula of a prostate probe, like this. And it's going to tell you, I'm going to rotate the probe to cover the, the, the defect. Actually, this is useless. You cannot depend on this in defining the inner fistula. But like this, you have a picture which has the five layers of the inner canal. And putting in this situation, you can see an abscess and you can see there is an intrasynthetic abscess here. And you can diagnose if the abscess is missing fistula and so on. So to do end to end ultrasound, you must have a 360 degree ultrasound, not the prostatic probe. For the MRI, as you can see, this is a, a T1 image, uh, T2 image, as you see, this is a fistula, so MRI can delineate the fistula easily, like this one, and like this one. You can delineate the fistula easily, and you can see in this picture, this is a fistula like this, and this is a post-operative fistula, it's appear actually the uh, hyper-intense picture that is present here for a fistula disappeared here, so this is a post-operative picture. So after you do the clinical examination and after you do the radiological, either the endoinal ultrasound or the MRI and you are sure about the mapping of the inner fistula or anatomy of the inner fistula and the uh, 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 condition of the sphincter, if you're having a sphincter defect, the length of the sphincter, if it is long, if it is short, and so on. After you know all this, you need an operation in order to make your patient happy. And the ideal operation, it should eradicate the sepsis and the granulation tissue, and should promote healing, and should preserve confidence, and without recurrence. And I'm sorry to say, it does not exist. Every operation that we are going to talk about it will have one point of this that is not present. Look, let's look at this. This is the classic procedure. The classic procedure is a lay open that I think almost all of us are doing it. Almost all of us are doing it, which simply you go by a probe through the sphincter, through the fistula from the external opening, pass through the whole way to the internal opening, and you lay it open. And then you do curettage of the uh, base of the fistula. This is the common procedures that we're using. It's simple and easy. It's very good for intersphincteric and low transsphincteric fistula. It's low recurrence rate, sometimes zero, and the maximum it can be 5%. However, rate of incontinence, it depends from 5 to 30%. And I can tell you that there is under recording of the rate of incontinence of these patients. <clears throat> simply because females and males are got ashamed from reporting that they are in contact. The same is that sometimes patient or to doctors, they got some degree of contents, and then he tell, he, the doctor tells the patient this is normal, nothing abnormal. But usually the incontinence occur in the high transesphincterics that involve more than 50% of the sphincter, and the suprasphincteric for sure, and the extra sphincteric 100%, and the all anterior fistula in female, and we talked about the natural defect of the external inner sphincter in female, so if you're going to do it anteriorly, again, a new cut of the sphincter, so probably you are having a high percentage of having incontinence, and in Crohn's disease, simply because the Crohn's disease, primarily by itself, it affects the sphincter, because it's a transneural disease, and the second is that the Crohn's disease is making more than one fistula, so cutting the sphincter in more than one place lead to incontinence. And these are the precautions that you have to take care of during lay open. First, you must have a good light and a good patient position. And we are, are going to talk about the patient position in a second. Never cut more than 50% of the extended inner sphincter. If you're done more, so wait for incontinence. You have to assess the sphincter lens before surgery. So don't wait until the time of surgery to assess the sphincter lens. You have to assess the sphincter lens during examination at the office or by MRI. You have to have a malleable probe. You can have it by uh, copper malleable probe or uh, silver malleable probe, but 
the steel malleable and steel probes that is present in most of the hospital is not good and it, it probably lead to false passage and you, it cannot take the shape of the fistula that sometimes it's it's a bizarre shape it's better to do it under general anesthesia not a spinal anesthesia simply all the anesthesiologist you're going to do anal surgery so let's give him a spinal actually the spinal anesthesia is going to make everything relax so you're going to feel the sphincter you're not going to feel the sphincter you're not going to feel the sphincter is the anal uh, is the uh, inner rectal muscle ring so probably you're going to cut without knowing where you are cutting so please general anesthesia and with minimal uh, muscle relaxation will help you to know where are you cutting and to tell yourself no i have to stop here i'm not going to cut more muscles use towels not gauze all the nurses is going to give you just pieces of gauze to dry and if you have a large amount of blood so you're not going to see very well so please use a towel in order to dry the blood that is uh, going to happen during cutting because simply because you're cutting a muscle and when you are cutting a muscle so you are expecting bleeding so please use towel not don't use gauze at the end be sure that you did a very good hemostasis so that you don't need to put a pack so surgeons who are still putting a pack actually the patient will have very bad experience from removing this pack in the final advice please use a post operative analgesia potent up to now and after 25 years doing a colorectal surgery i'm still giving my patients nalafin or tramel post operative for a week or 10 days up to now the patients feel happy i don't like as a patient to feel pain because if you are going to give him a hard time he's going to give you a hard time let's talk about the position if you ask your nurses to put the patient in a lasotomy position they might look like this and if you ask them just pull the patient to be on the edge they are going to put the patient like this and the, and the, the worker is going to tell you doctor say doctor no he is on the edge i cannot pull him more and he's going to leave the like this. and probably if you put the patient like this the inner canal will be sunken you're going to see nothing you have to put the patient like this one can you see there is a hip flexion and the patox at the edge of the table in this situation you're going to see the inner canal in front of you you don't need to put adhesive plaster in order to pull the patox you don't need that just put him in this position you're going to see everything easily and the light will be inside the inner canal so if bleeding happens or if you want to look for the internal internal opening and you want to inject some dye or hydrogen peroxide to see the internal opening it will be easy for you to see but any of these positions you're going to see nothing you must stick to the abdomen during probing if you find yourself without pushing without rest that the inner probe go through the more than a half or above the inner rectal muscle ring so please don't cut the sphincter because the patient will be in contact just you need to put a setter and the setter is just a thread of a non absorbable material so it cannot be by vicryl or it cannot be by um, dixon it need to be by non absorbable material like silk or polypropylene any of them and this setter it can be a cutting setter or a draining setter this is the cutting setter you put a probe and then usually the probe got a hole at the end you put the thread and then you pull the probe and then you tie the thread so this is the cutting set and you tie the thread strongly tough in order to press on the skin here and after one week you untie it and put another one and tie it again and as you can see it goes staged fistulato you are cutting through the skin and the sphincter step by step until at the end you cut the whole fistula trach actually in this stage you are doing a fistulotomy but it is a staged fistulotomy in order to allow more fibrosis and this more fibrosis will hold the sphincter in position it does not uh, gap and if it does not gap the incontinence will be much less or if you are having more one than one thing 
or if you are going to do the ketone at the transitory period until everything calms down and you're going to do fistulotomy later on, so probably you can put a loose set. So the laser will sit in the track and you, you can see it's loose. It's not pressing on the skin or on the sphincter. Just you put it in order for no abscess to accumulate. You're keeping the fistula open, internal opening and external opening. So no abscess. And at the same time, presence of foreign body lead to a foreign body reaction. And this foreign body reaction fix the sphincter in place. So when you later uncut it, so no gabbing of the sphincter occur. So the cutting setup is a stage of fistulotomy. So this is the treatment. But for the drain setup, this is just a transitory period until you do the fistulotomy later on. So all these procedures, the fistula lay open and the setons are the classic procedure that we are using in most of our cases. However, sometimes you find the patient that have surgery three times and he's already partially incontent now. And by the way, let me go back for a second. When your patient, when you are doing intersphincteric or transsphincteric fistula, many of our patients got incontinence to flatus for three to four months until complete healing. This is totally normal. You have to tell your patient that before surgery, because when you tell him before surgery, he can't believe you. But when you tell him after surgery, probably he's not going to believe that much that this is normal. So sometimes the patient come with already he got incontinence or he's having more than one trick and you're afraid of cutting more than the sphincter in more than one place, or <clears throat> he is having a Crohn's disease, so you're afraid, or a female with an anterior fistula and you're afraid of cutting the sphincter, in all these situations, and in a situation that you find a short inner canal, a female patient with a multipara and the sphincter forms only one and a half centimeters, and yes, the fistula open at the dentate line, but this is the dentate line, you're going to cut the whole sphincter. If this is a situation, you can choose one of the new techniques that we are going to talk about in the next few minutes. The new techniques can be mechanical and biological. I will leave the biologicals later on, but the mechanical. The first one, and the most famous now, is the lift. And as you can see here, and we're going to see in a video, as you can see, we know that the track comes through the inner canal, through the internal sphincter, through the intersphincteric place, and the external sphincter, and goes to the skin. So in intersphincteric fistula that you are, sorry, in transphincteric fistula that you are afraid from cutting both the internal and the external sphincter, you can make a small incision in the intersphincteric place, and then you can hook the fistula like this, and when you hook the fistula, you can double ligate and cut the fistula and just leave it. In this situation, you disconnect it, the internal opening from the external opening. And we have one of two situations. The first situation is that everything heals up, and it occurs in about 60 to 65% of cases. And the second possibility is that it recurs, but when it recurs, the external part disappears, and it recurs as intersphincteric fistula, not transsphincteric fistula, and in this situation, the lay open will be much easier and will be without major effect on continence. And this video is a video for a lift. As you can see, you're going to put the probe. We are injected eye to see the internal opening, and then we are going to open to go through the intersphincteric plane. You open the intersphincteric plane while the probe in, inside in order to, to see, and then you go with the right angle for In order to hook, We want to hook the track now. This is the fistula track. Now what you need to do is that to double ligate and cut this fistula track. And as you can see, pulling here lead to pulling the external opening because it's only one track and this one track, the five track. So 
going to fall on both sides, both the internal opening and the external opening. So you can ligate it with either long-standing suture like the uh, uh, monocryl, or uh, sometimes some people are ligating it by just a vehicle, you know, no specific rule how to ligate it. But usually the absorbable sutures, you know, are less possible to form a granuloma in this part of the, of the body. As you can see, <coughs> will I get this, the, the side towards the internal opening? And then we're going to get the side towards the external opening, and we are done. And let's see the, the, the results of the, of the lift operation. Different number of patients, but look at this. Our results in Alexandria University around 67%. Some people reach it to 94% or 87%, and the others are probably using the same range, 60 to 61%. Some people are charging lift procedure, and then the excise the uh, uh, external opening with the connected port. Probably you're having better results. We didn't try him here that much, but you know, it's, it's an option that you can use. You can put a biological mesh in between the two cut end of the lift. However, it's very expensive. Let's go to the second procedure, which is the mucosa advancement flame. As you can see, this is internal opening and this is the trick what you do just to size the mucosa part with the internal opening and then to pull it to close the internal opening by advancement flare of the mucosa. Success rate between 37 and 75 percent, the recurrence from zero to 60 percent. So we don't know. So if you inject the blitter rich plasma, some people are talking about improvement but we are not sure that it improved actually the results. The inner fistula black is a biological black that you can put in order to obliterate the inner canal. And we're gonna see a video how we are gonna obliterate the inner canal. As you can see, this is diagram for a fistula and the help we are gonna do. You define the opening. And then you put a thread through the end of this track. And then you pull the plug. to obliterate the inner fistula track from the tender opening to the center opening. <clears throat> and then you fix the plug to the mucosa by a suture. And as you can see, you're gonna take a sort of a burst string suture around the plug in order to completely fix it as an internal opening in order to avoid the slippage of the inner plug from the uh, fistula track.
and then you tie it and remove the extra part that is uh, of the plug that is present inside the inner canal. As you can see, you're going to tie it now. And then removal of the extra part, and then close this defect in the in the mucosa in order to completely obliterate the internal album. Fibrin sealant. Some people are using fibrin glue. I'm not sure success rate between 30 to 60 percent. We, we didn't try here. However, no impairment in continence. The waft. This is a, a video assisted inner fistula treatment, and this is. It just you put a scope inside the fistula, very fine scope. It's not useful if the fistula is a horseshoe or if it is uh, um, uh, having a bizarre shape. You must have a straightforward fistula and you just cauterize the fistula tray. But let me talk about the important that everybody is leaving questions over this part. The feel like lasers or the lasers, how you're going to use laser. First, the real laser is this one. Is that uh, laser probe that you're going to put inside the fistula tray in order to destroy the fistula epithelium with a success rate from 60 to 70 percent. However, the probe is really expensive, around 7,000 pounds here in Egypt. And this is how it can be done. Okay, I'm sorry for that, but this is how we put the diode laser probe. We're going to put it here like this through the external opening till the internal opening. And then we cauterize every single part of the inner fistula tray. During pulling out of the probe, you cauterize every single part from the opening till the external opening. And after that, you excise the external fistula uh, track, external opening, just in order to make it easy for healing, because usually it's fibrosed edge and it cannot heal easily. Some people choose to close the internal opening by suture, some people don't, but you can do it both ways. The biologics, stem cells, you're gonna hear about it. We don't use it here in Egypt, but you can hear about it. Probably if a patient got a major sphincter defect and you cannot do any of this procedure, so it might be a solution for these patients. And for a Crohn's patient, please don't try to do lay open. You can just give the uh, anti-tumor necrosis factor in fleximab is going to help the patient to uh, be cured. And if not, so draining setum will be more than enough for this patient. So in conclusion, lay open is, a, is your first option. If not, so setum will be the second option. If not, you can choose between left or mucosal advancement flab or laser. However, we know that all the results that we have talked about since a few minutes from a small sample size with a short follow-up, no randomized comparison, and actually they didn't differentiate between the crypt glandular and the Crohn's fistula. And always remember that patient is not going to die, but no ideal operation. Thank you. لاست بات نوت ليست طبعا في الاخر ب... بنحب نشكر نتوجه بالشكر للبروفيسور دكتور خالد على الفروتفول انتراكتيف توك ولو في لو في اي استفسار او اي ريكومنديشن من من حضراتكم ممكن في شات بوكس موجوده تحت في في السكرين ممكن حضراتكم تجوين از ا جيست لو في اي سؤال لدكتور خالد 
بلاست اللي في في ايكون ثانيه مكتوب عليها كليم سيرتيفيكت حضراتكم بتخشوا بتملوا سيرفي ويزن 1 مينيت بحيث يوصلكم السيرتيفيكت بتاعه الايفنت على الميل بتاع حضراتكم اه تمام آه طيب آه اخيرا آه يعني بنشكر حضرتك دكتور خالد على الانتر اكتف سيشن ووقت حضرتك وتواجدك معانا النهارده ونتمنى ان شاء الله وانت بالصحه والسلامه ونتمنى ان شاء الله نتكرر نتكرر مع حضرتك مرارا وتكرارا باذن الله ان شاء الله ثانك يو فيري ماتش شكرا يا جماعه شكرا يا دكتور كل سنه وحضراتكم طيبين